It was years ago that my parents um, gave me for Christmas uh, The Legend of Black Wolf, Bob's film. And, you know, it truly is one of the reasons th that movie truly affected um, my course in life, as it has many, many of us. Um, he is a remarkable filmmaker, able to capture footage that is just unbelievable and um, tell an amazing story in a way that brings such life to these animals um, and helps us in understanding them so much more deeply than ever we could. Uh, so Betsy and I went to the International Wolf Symposium last year, and he was there. And uh, his presentation was just amazing. It brought tears to our eyes. It was just moving. It was beautiful. And immediately, we looked at each other and said, oh, gosh, wouldn't it be amazing if we could get him to come and give this presentation in Sedona? So then we just happened to run into him at the elevator. <laughs> and I, I bravely approached him. And I had met him a year before in Yellowstone um, briefly, briefly, he was in the middle of um, doing a time lapse, and we approached him with some friends who were friends of his, and we're chatting and stuff. And he was like, "Oh, by the way, I'm doing a time lapse, so make sure you don't walk in front of the camera, okay?" To which one of us, being just completely dopey, immediately walked in front of the camera, and <laughs> I'll never forget the look on his face. It was hilarious, and we were like, "Ah!" Oh. But um, so I approached him, and I, I, I asked him if he would be willing to do it uh, here in Sedona. And he didn't say no. So I was like, aha. So then Betsy and I, <laughs> Betsy and I talked to him again, you know, and just mentioned it, planting the seed. And then later, you know, an, a month later, we were in Yellowstone and we went out for dinner, to which I asked him again, just, hey, what do you think? Have you had some time to think about it? And he was still kind of like on the fence. But then we ran into him again at a grocery store to which we put it in his brain again. And then we called him almost every day after that for over a month until we finally got him to say yes. So <laughs> I'm just going to um, share his biography. Um, he really is um, an icon in filmmaking uh, when it comes to uh, wolf behavior and the, the wolves of Yellowstone especially. He was trained, actually, to be a math teacher, but from an early age, he wished to be a wildlife filmmaker. At age 20, Bob began filming with his father big game hunts in northern British Columbia. In a few years, he and his wife were traveling further up the Alaska Highway to Denali National Park in Alaska, where here he met Adolf Murray, and his life changed from hunting with a gun to hunting with a camera. Although Landis has filmed many species, his first love has always been wolves. Bob Landis has co-produced and filmed nine productions with National Geographic Television and Nature, one, Wolf Pack, won an Emmy for Best Science Film of 2002. Landis enjoys sharing his work directly with others through his lectures and happily shares his footage with the researchers of Yellowstone. His footage has appeared in many productions and he has appeared recently in National Geographic Channel production, Wolf Dynasties, and I am so honored to have you here and I'm honored to introduce Bob Landis. <laughs> Thank you, Paula. Thank you. <laughs> I would also add that I like short introductions, so <laughs> that was pretty exceptional. Uh, how many of you have seen a wild wolf, a wolf in the, in the wilds? And then how many of you remember the day, I uh, say the time and where you were at when you saw that? Okay, so, so wolves are, are, are so remarkable because it's probably the only animal that I could tell you, uh, that you know, ask the same question, and you could reply with uh, a definite yes or no. They just have that charisma that, that no other animal has. Maybe the grizzly, but not so much. So last night, if you saw the two films, we kind of went from Black Wolf being a complete, very professional, polished film. Uh, done by Geographic mostly, I did the filming and they did the, uh, all the other parts of the film, to uh, not so professional with just my partner and I, although we've had some experience doing this, it was not nearly the investment of money, to what you're going to do tonight, which is me lecturing 
the footage, but much of what you saw last night, only uncut, so you'll see it instead of cutting to a close-up of some kind or a cutaway to a raven. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a little slower paced. Hopefully it's a little more honest than you saw then. And uh, what, I, what we've had in Yellowstone up until recently is an incredible experience of watching wolves that have not been exploited. But what does a real wolf do out there in the wild, unsupported by humans, un interfered with by humans, except for us people that are on the road, of course, with our vehicles? So with that, then, we'll get started. By the way, I saw my first wolf along the Alaskan Highway, and uh, that was in 1956. So I do remember. And I'm going to take you back to that place. So where did our wolves come from originally? Well, some of them came from Hinton, Alberta. That was the 1995 reintroduction. And some came from Pink Mountain, British Columbia, where I saw my first wolf. Uh, possibly we could have another reintroduction. <laughs> I need a new subject for my films, and maybe Sasquatches would do it. <laughs> so I was there when the wolves came under the arch in the uh, horse trailer. It, it raised quite a to-do. We had photographers, uh, press, even the Arizona man, the Bruce Babbitt, who was at that time the Secretary of the Interior, helped carry the wolves into the the exclosures, which were designed to keep wolves for about six weeks to become acclimated to Yellowstone. They were released from these cages uh, into the... Ex you can into see her inside. She's a big gray female, just gorgeous, relaxed, kind of looking up and blinking her eyes. I, for all the world, like my dog sort of lying at the dinner table. It's, it's an unbelievable sight. All right, boys. So without people like that, we wouldn't have wolves in, in Yellowstone. Now, after the... Uh, all the hoopla was over with, which was about a day. Then the heavy lifting occurred, including carrying these 200-pound cages with wolves up to the, the pens. We had some volunteers that worked for $7 a day at the time, covered all expenses, including feeding the, uh, the wolves with roadkill mostly. Some of these people, the one on the right, went on to get a PhD. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, this Camera is gear set up over here. If a wolf runs by and knocks it over, that's just the way it goes. Mike, right? That's Mike Phillips. You probably all know Mike. Uh, very concerned with having wolves come back to southern Colorado. We're on these two right here. So what are we doing here? Well, they're trying to capture these wolves with salmon nets so they can tranquilize them and move them to a different pen, which is 50 miles away in a place where there were no packs. There was an existing pack just outside of this uh, cage. Okay, now pick behind her, Bob. You can actually hear the, uh, the, the wild wolves outside the cage howling at us. So the wolves were treated with great respect. Uh, we had a, a better veterinarian that was uh, very concerned that they be treated, including using muzzles that covered the eyes when they were tranquilized. Uh, every effort was made to have as little human uh, contact as possible, although it certainly was a nice fur rough. So that day, the wolfing was very good. They caught seven or eight wolves and moved them down to this enclosure, where eventually they opened the back of the pen so the wolves could get out and become literally wild wolves without any further human contact, except for the few that were finally uh, trapped and, and collared. So what did we learn of all this experience? And one of the first things we found was in 1995, uh, wolves were starting to become acclimated to the road, but they still were quite a ways. This is at a, oh, not quite a mile away from the road. Long telephoto. And much to our surprise, this pack of five wolves, uh, which consisted, of course, of the alpha pair, the alpha pair pay, played no part in this in this hunt for these uh, for these elk. It's just two yearlings. So, but the most more importantly, we found that maybe all those things we've been reading for years about wolves taking the sick and the old was true because they soon 
concentrated on this cow that had a right rear leg problem that was calcified and very stiff. So even though she kind of lost herself amongst the rest of the herd, they targeted in on her and eventually made the kill. This was never used, this particular sequence, because it was too distant, the animals were too small. There's only one other case where I could actually say that I knew that the animal was uh, injured or, or infirm before the kill was made, and that was this case where this cow was chased into the lake by, by the pack, and as she swam by, we saw that, that that lower jaw was very much enlarged. And I, I think that's why the wolves picked on her rather than the cow-calf pair that was also in the lake. So eventually she uh, made a run for it here. The wolf ran her down and killed her out of sight, which happens quite a bit in my experience. Things either happen behind a hill or whatever, but this is a jawbone, and that left jaw again was quite swollen. So if you look at now a, a more typical chase, we have no idea whether this animal is infirm or not, except that it's going through what's called a stot, and it's trying to demonstrate here to the wolves that it's perfectly healthy because it can do a very energy intensive run. And indeed, this wolf, wolf or this uh, elk was able to easily outdistance these wolves. So uh, this is now shortly after that chase, they picked out another cow. The interesting thing here is that the gray wolf is a yearling, the other two are older blacks, including 302, and how much faster she is. And this is typical of most chases, and that is that the younger wolves, especially the females, do most of the bringing the animal to bay and then uh, the, the bigger animals, uh, the bigger uh, males, come in using their weight to good advantage to drag the animal down. So one of these is 302, the other is its brother. So that's the, uh, of course, see 302 is a famous Casanova wolf who became a very good hunter. So one of the myths that we had coming into uh, watching wild wolves this, in this situation was that the, the wolves all feed about the same time. There isn't this hierarchy at the carcass of uh, the alphas feeding first and then on down the line. Everybody pitches in and, and feeds first. So we learned some things from captive wolves, but a lot of things are different when the wolves are able to move throughout the, the environment. These are younger wolves now. There's a couple of pups here in the chase, maybe a yearling, and they've cornered this bull. The adults are off to the screen left and kind of watched all this chase and said, what's the use? That animal is really too healthy to chase. There they are up there. And this animal survived fine, but it was a good learning experience for those younger animals. Now animals do disperse. Uh, they have to in order to of course, increase and have different packs, but a single wolf out there is, is really at a disadvantage for many reasons, but one of which is it's difficult to kill an elk if you're only a single wolf. And yet that's what they have to do in order to, to eat and, of course, to survive. But this one uh, worked at this for quite a while, a couple hours actually off and on, and eventually suffered some pretty if not damaging, at least humiliating kicks, including the last one. So if you're thinking of coming back as a wolf, you may want to change your mind. <laughs> <laughs> so two things on breeding that I, that I want you to remember. One is that the, uh, there's very little incest. Here they off a male 21 is trying to mate his daughter, and we think that possibly this is why there isn't any incest. It's up to the female to as always. <laughs> the other thing is, in the pack, generally it's just the alpha pair that breeds, especially if the other females are his daughters. Uh, so he, in this case, uh, 302 is patrolling and keeping his uh, nephew from breeding. I'm going to now look at some breeding strategies. The most common one, at least to begin with, is a, a, a a female would disperse from her pack, a male would disperse from his pack, 
there'd be some howling possibly miles away from the two territories. They would meet, they would then court each other with a, with something that's uh, quite similar in the sense that they do a lot of uh, bowing. We saw that last night, and we'll see it again here again with 21 and 40. In this case, there were two females. They were both from the same pack, and you can see already that dominance and who is going to be the alpha was figured out. Uh, if there's a vacancy in a pack, this happens occasionally where the, the male dies and if there's no beta to take over. Uh, so this wolf 21 really kind of fell into it when he found the druid pack without their alpha male and beta male, both of which had been killed outside the park. Well, it's not a slam dunk as far as being accepted into the pack and becoming the new alpha. There's quite a bit of testing that goes on to see if you're suitable material or not. So notice his behavior and his structure, very stiff. Uh, she, uh, the, the, this is the beta female, number 42, does a typical uh, bow there, uh, uh, very, uh, and eventually uh, 21 is accepted into the pack. When I showed this to the executive producer, he said, well, we'll never use it because I don't know what the, all that chasing is about. And I said, well, I think you better use it. It's pretty good. And not only that, but it really fits into the story. So this is now what we saw a little bit later in the, in the expansion of wolves in Yellowstone, where a male would come from some distance, do a lot of howling. If there were eligible females in the pack, they might come out away from the pack and do a meet and greet. Usually the alpha male and sometimes the beta males would try to uh, keep this animal from staying with those females. However, this was 113, the big male from the, across the way, from way over uh, the western part of the, of the park. And then there was 302. 302 had this exactly unique way of handling it. And, he sh and I'm sure Rick will tell this story on Saturday because it's his favorite story. So he shows up and we, we, we didn't know who it was. I mean, it was a black uncollared wolf and it, we hadn't had much experience with this kind of interaction or not. But he came and did the same thing that 21 had done and that is try to attract females. Uh, and a couple of the yearling females were very anxious to meet him, including this one. So he, he should right now be starting to run for his life because <laughs> <laughs> you know this is the dad and of course he's very concerned about his daughters being uh, not going with the right male. <laughs> and so instead of running, it, 302 just ran toward the 21 and could have been killed at this point, but he is faster so it, he, did, he had an escape thing there. So eventually, if within a month or so, he, he was accepted by the beta and yearling females, bred a couple of them, and then when another pack came along, he deserted those females. They decided it was better off just going back with their mother and the original druid den. And he was left then to use the road from the druid territory back to the, his home, which was about 25 miles away. And the road was by far the easiest way to move because it was plowed, there was no snow. He did this during the day and at night and became, of course, the at least half of the story that you saw last night with Black Wolf. He then eventually formed his own pack in a very interesting way by bringing three or four of his nephews along. He met up with three females from a different pack and immediately had a pack that could compete for territory on the northern range, which was packed with, with other wolves and other wolf packs. Well, uh, this is a, another example of a deadbeat dad situation. This black pup uh, doesn't belong here because the two females, or the male and the, and the female are both gray. And two grays can't have a black pup. So we have a situation again similar to the 302 situation that is a yearling left the pack, yearling female, was bred by a black, an unknown black, then returned to her home den 
to have her pup or pups with her mother. And it's possible that there just wasn't any territory available. So I uh, kind of abbreviate that to say there's no house available. And so she then went back to her home pack, not because the, the male wasn't suitable, but just there wasn't any place for them. Well, then her parents, of course, were killed. And now there is a territory available. And that same black male, a year later, comes back and breeds her again. And they have pups. And this pack survived for eight years. It was the heart of uh, the white wolf pack, the white wolf uh, story that you saw last night with the. Uh All right, this has also been seen a couple of times, and that is the, the pack is small, relatively small, maybe has only one male in it. And it is vulnerable then for a pack takeover in which the, uh, the male is chased off by other males and then the, uh, his pack is, is adopted basically by these uh, marauding males. So these are mollies and they're known for that kind of behavior. So they chased off the alpha male, which was 755, took over the pack, adopted the pups. So part of it was very African lineish and that is chasing off the, the breeding male but instead of killing the pups, they adopted them and actually formed a much stronger pack than was originally there because they now have three large males to help with things. And so this is now the Wapiti pack a couple years later, much, uh, again, much stronger than it was with just 755. So let's get the, the results of all that, of course, is breeding and having pups. And now I'd just like to look at some situations where we have some pup play. There's not a whole lot of research being done on pup play because, for one thing, it's hard to quantify. And also, we don't have a lot of chances to, to see dens. But in this case, uh, these two pups were practicing their mouse pounces. Uh, as they got larger, they were more independent, were able to move away from the den hole. I still had problems, however, with, uh, well, with the vertical surfaces. <laughs> <laughs> well, as you can imagine, uh, there's lots of activity with those five pups. Uh, after a few months, they're led away from the den and, and go into a rendezvous area where they aren't using a den hole necessarily, but it does concentrate them so the adults can find out where the pups are at. And in this case, uh, the rendezvous was near the Yellowstone River, which offered a whole bunch of different techniques as far as play, including uh, keep away. Well. For me as a, f a filmmaker and a storyteller, uh, having one black amongst these grays was a perfect storytelling technique because you could immediately identify the, the pup because of his color. And it became then, as you remember last night, as the first half of the black wolf story. Well, so there's lots of communal play between the pups, but there's also pups uh, play uh, just on their own, and including when you have a moving object to stalk, it adds to the, uh, the learning experience. <laughs> and as I said, anything moving is subject to be <laughs> grabbed onto, <laughs> including moving bubbles in the river. <laughs> <laughs> And then there's this rock slide uh, on the side of the river, no, nothing moving on it. But one of the yearlings took the, the, the pups over to the slide and by just watching and moving and walking, suddenly these rocks be became moving objects and were, of course were subject to being stalked. <laughs> 
This is actually a puppet from 96, 95, and two years later, the, a completely different set of pups was up there doing exactly the same thing, stalking rocks. <laughs> so play is great, except when, when food is available, then usually the play stops. Uh, that's a higher priority. Uh, and, and food is delivered in the stomach of the, of the adults. The pups know that. And as we saw even with our, our wolves here, they like to kiss, which helps to, to encourage the female to regurgitate food. It, it doesn't do it in just one, I'll call it vomiting, but... Uh, <coughs> She does it in several places so that all the pups have an equal chance to get at, at the uh, chunks of meat. Now if we go six months later, of course the weather has changed quite a bit. Those same pups now are almost adult size. They probably weigh 70 to 80 pounds and uh, still full of play. Even I've, I've noticed with, with lots of different animals besides wolves, but wolves also, is that Anything that deals with heights, like a bank, can be used to good advantage to play sort of king of the mountain or king of the bank in this case. It, it can also be used to hide from your sibling. <laughs> <laughs> At least you can think you're hiding. That little depression is, is just an erosion part, but they kept repeating the using it here to. <laughs> and one advantage is that you could, when you or up against it, it held those moving objects still so you could capture them. <laughs> uh, most importantly, the tail. Uh, 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 so it, in my filming experience, the the hunting and the killing was actually reasonably easy with wild wolves, but the most difficult thing <laughs> was anything that dealt with pups, young pups, and particularly play. So this opportunity for me was just a gold mine. I just, just, it was fun to watch, but it was also a good storytelling technique. Uh, in that case, uh, the wolf had caught, I think, a, a shrew. And in this case, uh, he's caught some ice. And in all of this, you see a lot of the same things that our, tame wolf, our dogs do, including chewing on ice. I'm sure some of you have dogs that you give ice cubes to. Well, that's where it came from, right there. Uh, playing with your food, of course, is uh, OK if you've got plenty of food. Uh, And this I really loved, because you know, he intentionally went and dug out this cone and then dropped it on the cornice here and used it much like they, he did the bowling, ro rolling rocks uh, on that slope to stalk. This was even better because it ro actually rolled down the hill further than those rocks did. <laughs> uh, so where do those cones come from? Well, in this case, he just he got it out of the snow, but you can go up and actually get the cones off of the tree. It just takes a little work. <laughs> uh, uh, all these uh, younger wolves have to, of course, learn how to deal with coyotes. Uh, it's interesting how they've gotten along with each other. Uh, so that's the winter, and, and then the play actually uh, decreases as they do get older, but it, it still is important to note that as adults, even as the alphas, there is some play in the pack. There are no pups here. These are all either yearlings or mature wolves. That's probably a younger one. 
but it's the same bank, except of course it's now in August. Same game of king of the bank, or in this case probably a queen, leaps over the alpha female, <laughs> which was 06. And then finally, uh, they, they ran and chased across this little stream, which for, for filming purposes was perfect. It's backlit water and slow motion. And well, there's lots of research going on in the park, and it's a very good thing. And one of the things that's being studied by a couple from Canada who did lots of research in Algonquin Park, and now live in uh, British Columbia, but they're trying to tie in wolf howls with behavior. So if, if there's a certain howl given, can they determine a behavior that the wolves will do? And they have found that they're accurate about 50% of the time, which again indicates that wolves are, like humans, they're not necessarily predictable. And one thing they have found, however, if they graph the, the number of howls in a certain uh, month, it's very U-shaped with the most howling occurring toward the uh, December. In the summer, it's mostly a communication type device between pack members. So here the alpha female was calling back to her pack. fall, of course, still same kind of howling, uh, trying to figure out who's where and, and recombining into the pack. But as we get into December, it, it becomes more territorial in the sense that packs will howl against packs. So here they're responding to a pack that was off about two miles. Uh, this is the Wapiti pack. We saw this is the daughter of the white wolf. And this uh, howling occurred about every hour they would go into this howling bout. Uh, very uh, noticeable would be when two packs come together and they're challenging, not only letting them know, know, know that one pack is in the same place, but also actually trying to intimidate the other pack and that's done with this very agitated bark howl. And these are the, the four canyon pack answering the mollies. And, and for good reason, the mollies are a very aggressive pack. Uh, we looked at now uh, some sound sink howling rather than just being dubbed in. Uh, this wolf was trying to find a mate, as was this one. So quite different. Certainly wolves can identify individual wolves. <laughs> and the classic howl that probably, if I ask you to howl right now, you would, you would do this howl. I don't think too many of you would be barking out I've there. kind of been focusing the last seven or eight years now on aggressive interactions between packs. So we know that wolves are territorial. It's one of the ways we describe them. You know, if you just look them up in the dictionary, wolves are territorial. But what does that mean? How do they treat their neighbors? What does that mean for how they treat each other? Um, and what are the details surrounding that? What kind of patterns can we find? And I've been trying to find these patterns for the last few years. I first became interested in territoriality when I saw, I was spending a lot of time in the field. I was a field technician for the wolf project at the time, and I was going out every day in the field and trying to track wolf packs, and every once in a while I would see when two of them ran into each other and fought. And I became really curious on what makes one pack win over the other, uh, what individual wolves were doing, what how they decided whether to take a part in the chase or just run away and avoid the whole thing, and all of these really cool details that had to do with this territorial behavior, not only at a group level, but at an individual level. And so um, I've been trying to figure out the nuances uh, in that ever since. We've found out quite a bit about territoriality in the last few years. Um, what makes one pack win over the other, 
how individuals make the decision on wa essentially weighing their costs and the benefits of taking part in something that's pretty dangerous. Uh, these aggressive interactions between PACs accounts for two-thirds of their natural mortality. So it's something that they have to deal, a very serious thing they have to deal with in their life. When two PACs fight, um, or when they run into each other, often they howl and they figure out where the other PAC is. Sometimes they'll come together then and chase. And some of the interactions just end at a chase and they'll go their separate ways. Sometimes the wolf is attacked, and then sometimes we see a wolf is killed by a rival pack. And the pack that ends up winning those encounters, we tested, we took all of the data we'd seen for over 16 years and tested all of these demographic categories, whether the size of the wolf pack compared to their opponent, whether they were uh, at a home field advantage or whether they were intruding or not, and then all kinds of measures of the number of adult males they had in the pack, the number of pups they had, just to see what kind of characteristics made them more likely to win over the other. And uh, one of the most important factors was, of course, living in a bigger pack. This matches up really well with a lot of different species, like lions and chimpanzees. The bigger the group, the more successful you are. But for wolves, we ended up with really uh, cool results related to the demographics of the group. So if the group has more adult males, they were more likely to win. Um, the adult males are the biggest and the strongest. They're 20% larger than adult females in the pack, and so they're the, essentially the fighters. They're the muscle. But the most important factor, even more important than living in a large group, was if a pack had an old wolf in it. And this shocked me because I really thought that if there was one age category that would be important, that it would be these prime-aged wolves that are big and strong at their physical peaks, but it was the old wolves. And the old wolves actually sit out hunting sometimes. They let the young wolves take down prey um, so that they can stay safe. They're just not at their physical prime anymore. But during these aggressive interactions, they were the most important age category present. And I really attribute this back to their leadership and their experience. Old wolves, which I categorized as six or older, were much more likely to have run into neighbors before. They kind of probably can deal better with the chaotic nature of these aggressive interactions. Um, they may also avoid interactions they know they can't win. <laughs> and so they might be able to kind of up their winning percentages in that way. But it was fascinating to me that this wolf that people might think isn't contributing a whole lot to the pack anymore because they're not big and physical are contributing a lot to the pack through their their gathered experience throughout their whole life and their leadership and their accumulated knowledge so in yellowstone we have uh, packs some packs are all gray but not very many of them uh, if you think that there's 50% black and 50% gray wolves, then there should be about 50% uh, mixed packs, and 50% should be all gray, and probably 50% should be all black. 25%, uh, I got my math wrong there. So here's another example of an all gray pack. That was the, uh, the Hayden pack. And again, if it's all gray, it means the two breeders are gray. So most of the packs are like this. They've got some blacks and some grays, which means that either the, the breeding pair is, is black and gray, or it could be that they're, they're black, both are black. There's only one example I can give you of an all black pack, and it's a very small one, Lamar Canyon pack. It now has four. So the two breeders are black, and uh, so, why so what is we've that seen true? to find is that black wolves have a survival advantage, possibly because of the influence of the K locus on the immune system function, and gray wolves might have a fitness advantage in terms of reproduction because of an energetic trade-off and how an animal allocates its energy towards either uh, disease resistance or fighting off disease versus reproduction. Um, furthermore, we discovered that gray wolves, and this is from data from Kira Cassidy's work on aggressive and territorial behavior. Gray wolves are more aggressive than black wolves. 
And this matches data from domestic dogs. Domestic dogs that are black seem to be less aggressive and more friendly than non-black colored wolves. So this black coat color gene, even though it causes an animal to look a certain color, its coat color, it is operating in, in a different pathway in the animal's body to influence everything from reproduction to behavior to disease resistance. And what we're trying to do now is piece all these uh, elements together to kind of really unravel what the story is. So, and what further complicates this in terms of how we have both black and grays in the population is that from looking at the mate choice of wolves, over the last 20 years, we have a preponderance of black and gray breeding pairs compared to either gray-gray breeding pairs or black-black breeding pairs. And we call this disassortative mating. And Yellowstone wolves are the first example of a mammal demonstrating with really good data that opposites attract. And that mate choice is in part being influenced by the coat color of the individuals. And because when you have a black and a gray reproducing, their offspring, the odds of their offspring, the litters, having certain numbers of blacks and grays, is also help explaining why we seem to have a balance in both black and grays in the population. So there's this complex interaction between um, the underlying K locus genetics and behavior and physiology uh, around this K locus that um, is really mind blowing and, and we're trying to piece it all together. So those are just two of the many researchers that are, that are in the, actually three uh, in the park. Uh, and I would like to, to kind of go away from that and look at the impact of wolves on other species. So one thing that was predicted when wolves came back in is that they would just literally destroy the coyote population because they are, can be, you know, they can be very competitive. And so the wolves did kill a few coyotes. They also maybe more destructively <coughs> dug out their dens, especially those dens that were near wolf dens. Uh, this black, however, even apparently heeded the frantic calls of the coyotes because it did not get down to where the pups were at. Uh, it, shortly after it left, the female coyote went in and, and got her pups, which probably was a good thing uh, that the wolf did that because this wolf, this river raised about two feet and would have flooded the den. Anyway. Uh, we have coyotes in the park now. Uh, we're not sure the numbers are as high as they once were, probably not. Uh, they aren't quite as pack-like as they used to be, but they still are pack-like. There might be three or four adults uh, in a, a, a coyote pack. They, they need to deal with wolves now that they didn't have to before. If it's just a single wolf, they quite often can be quite aggressive with that animal. They, they target a certain area of the wolf, which is its lower leg, or rear leg. And just like a homing beam here. So being quicker, it can avoid those teeth. And uh, eventually this wolf got the message that it wasn't welcome near the den and, and everything was all right for a while. The relationship between wolves and ravens is legendary. Uh, the, the, the ravens can follow wolves uh, until they make a kill. They're usually the first ones, first of the scavengers on a site. And one raven doesn't eat much, but if you put 30 or 40 ravens on a carcass, it can shortly be uh, disassembled. Plus, they carry off chunks of meat and cache them for use. Uh, there is some interaction directly between the two species. A little bit of tail pulling. Uh, eagles come in and, and you make use of, of wolf kills. And there can be a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of fighting actually goes on because 
of course, the food source is life to both these species. Sometimes the golden winds and sometimes the coyote winds. There isn't much competition between these two, the fox and the coyote, the fox being quite a bit smaller. But when the coyotes leave and the, fox and the carcass is available then, it can be quite a gathering here of foxes that have this habit of leaping. <laughs> Usually for mice, but occasionally, uh, an eagle will eat too much and it can't fly, and at that point it can be vulnerable to wolf predation. We've seen it twice where wolves have killed golden eagles out of carcass. Uh, that one apparently uh, was okay, it could still fly. In the summer, we have a whole new uh, aspect of bears, including the large grizzlies that will follow wolves, although uh, not maybe too close because they're quite slower. But it, when a kill is made, it's, it's usually this is, occurs down in the uh, interior of the park. A large boar easily uh, displaces the, uh, the, the wolves. They, they might make a token effort to get the bear off the carcass. If it's a smaller bear like the sow with three cubs, then it's, it's a little bit different situation because the, uh, she has to protect those cubs from being killed by the wolves, as well as, as, as defending the carcass. But this one had an added level of complexity because a large boar did come along who could kill, also kill her cubs. So now she's faced with wolves and a large boar. But this is a different mother. I'd love to do a story about her if we could ever get, get enough footage because I've never seen this before where a, a small sow like that. <coughs> so never get in the way of a sow and her cubs is a probably a good lesson. Wolf predation has changed uh, somewhat as the elk numbers have decreased. Uh, they are now turning to, to bison. Uh, not this particular calf, which possibly is not really a calf, but a cat, because it's going through eight lives right now <laughs> as the Molly's pack um, tries to disperse, get, kill it, but it, it, the Calvary was uh, right there in the form of all those other bison. So the vegetation has changed in some places in the park. We can't make a complete story about it, but at least along some of the streams, the willows have come back, and with that, some of the birds that use the willows for their natural habitat. Uh, certainly the beavers have come back in some places uh, as families off to gather the fall uh, supply of willows. Maybe the biggest change that we've seen is, is in the aspen groves. So I just happened to film this uh, situation where they're doing a necropsy on the on a bull that had been killed, and Rolf Peterson was looking at the willows, which he studies in Al Rail to some extent, found that these were satisfactory as far as browsing is concerned. But for Yellowstone, that's pretty heavy over-browsing. I went back to that place 10 years later, and those same shoots had matured into 10 to 15 feet tall uh, aspen trees. This is another example of uh, the change in vegetation when there were lots of elk and they were all over the northern range, all these aspen groves were pretty well overbrowsed. And then this is the same place uh, 10 years later. Uh, oh, wolf watchers. We have. <laughs> I thought after the first 10 years or so that wolf watching would kind of die down as everybody had seen their wolf and had said, well, that's enough. But instead, the, the magic of wolf watching has actually increased. You still see wolves. At one time, we had wolf crossing guards. 
including Rick, that you'll hear on Saturday, uh, that was one of his jobs, was to protect the wolves so they could cross the road. This is usually at a denning place. We had, as far as I know, had no mortality on wolves, wolf being killed by car. There was one in the Lamar Valley. I'll take that back. Uh, UPS truck hit a wolf. So we still have lots of, uh, well, not so much of this anymore. There was a, this kind of utopian time when <laughs> Wolves and humans got along really well in the park. Uh, they were not being molested. And some of the wolves became almost too used to humans. Uh, they destroyed our snow stakes. Uh, would take the cones off and chew on them. And again, of course, use the roads for transportation to move from one place to another. Uh, we're still studying uh, wolves as I speak. There's a crew of, uh, I think, 10 to 15 volunteers mostly watching wolves from first light to last light, recording every move that they make, which becomes part of the vast knowledge that, that's being accumulated. But the situation changed about 2012 as far as wolves being used to and, and accommodating humans, including this situation where the Lamar Canyon pack had, had about 13 individuals, including the 06 female, 755, 754, the yearling, or the beta male, uh, quite a few uh, yearlings, and then four pups that year, I believe. It was easy to identify the pups because they acted like pups. And also they have this massive fur ruff around their necks, which disappears as they get older. But it's a good example of a multi-generational pack, which we had a lot of, uh, up to 10 or 12 of these kinds of packs in the park as opposed to just having a mated pair and their pups. Do you so see a difference when wolves are kind of living in this stable, multi-generational system like the 06 females pack before she died? You know, there were three different generations or three different age categories here. Um, we don't see that in exploited wolf populations as much. It's more of a pair and their pups of that year, and they're just hoping to make it to the next year. And if ev any of them live to be yearlings, um, it's, they're pretty lucky at that point. We have started to look at the impact of wolf hunting outside the park on the wolves inside the park and the research that's going on inside the park. And so the first thing we looked at was the population. Wolf hunting outside the park doesn't have uh, there's not a high enough proportion of our population taken to make the population numbers change, but it does seem to impact the social structure. When, especially when a pack loses a leader, like the 06 female, the Lamar Canyon pack is a great example of this. It kind of shakes things up pretty dramatically for them. This is schematic of the Lamar Canyon pack before the 06 female was shot. Um, when she and 754 were shot, this left the pack with just 755, who was the father to all the rest of the wolves in the pack. Because of that, he didn't have a breeding partner, and he left the pack. The rest of the wolves were trying to figure out uh, which one would be the new dominant female um, personality-wise. This meant that they were all kind of splitting up into different groups uh, for who they were most comfortable with or who they got along with the most. They were all joined by unrelated wolves. And so this really, because of the death of the 06 female, resulted in four different packs, or three different packs with a couple of lone wolves, 820 who tried to make it on her own and ended up dying the next year um, because she was having a difficult time raising her pups just by herself. 926 was joined by middle gray and a new uh, gray male. 926 helped raise middle gray's pups that first summer. Um, after their mother died, uh, 926 became the new alpha female of the Lamar Canyon pack and kept it going for another six years until she sh herself traveled outside the park and was shot by a hunter. So things have changed quite a bit, including the, uh, the fact that we were seeing wolves at a, quite a distance. So this is a chase that uh, would never be used because it's, at least in a finished film, because it's the images are so small. But it's still as fun to watch through a scope and it's still we're watching wild wolves in a natural situation. You probably, however, are not going to be able to look a wolf in the eye, even with a pretty strong scope. 
Uh, we, the research, again, continues on. We have quite a number of people coming in to watch wolves. But again, the, the ability to see a wolf this close will, is, is gone. On a certain January night, as the full moon rises over the northern range and the temperature inches toward 30 below, baritone howls shatter winter silence. Invisible wolf voices come from all around, from Chalcedony, Amethyst, Crystal, and Jasper, from Norris, Druid Peak, Secret Passage, and Slough, bouncing off cliff walls, echoing through valleys, calling the packs together. Those wisps of fog in Lamar, the play of shadows in the Aspen Forest, these shifting shapes are spirit wolves, the ones who have gone before, gathering for the Rose Creek Rendezvous. Like puffs of smoke from ancient fires, they drift silently along the frozen creek toward the acclimation pen. One by one, behind them, up the steep slopes and through the trees, the packs appear. Alpha's leading, suddenly solemn pups behind. The only sounds now are quiet breathing and whisper of paws on snow as they file past. Inside the deserted pen they greet in peace, bumping haunches, rubbing muzzles, gently placing soft chins on welcoming shoulders. Rivalry suspended, the packs have rendezvoused this magical night to tell once more the old tales of capture and release, of wildness and freedom, and to celebrate another anniversary of the return of wolves to Yellowstone. Uh, well. So, I guess we have a little time for questions, if there are any. That, that's the uh, third and the last show from me. I head back to Yellowstone tomorrow and hopefully uh, an opportunity to to film, but also to meet with the researchers there on on Saturday night when we have a banquet and kind of celebrate the end of the of the year research. Can we have them both on? Yeah. Can you hear me? Oh, there we go. <laughs> I'm new. Uh, um, <laughs> who has a question? Anybody have any questions for? Well, that's going to be easy. Uh, well, that is going to be easy. <laughs> we kind of exhausted it last night, and we need Pat here to prompt me. All right. We have a few here. Great. I was wondering, I was wondering on those collars that they put on, uh, how long do they last? Or do they, you know, like yesterday, I, we watched the Black Wolf one, and I think 302 went off and was never found. So, do they uh, do they go dead or what? Yes, they're battery driven, and this technology. So some of these collars actually go defunct within a day. Uh, they've had a lot of trouble over the 23 years with with that technology, and the GPS collars are that much more complicated than the, the VHS ones. But a good collar, on average, will last two years, giving out a signal. And then they'll try to recapture that animal uh, from the helicopter, dart it, and then put a new, new collar on it with a fresh battery. They can't just you know un unzip it and, and put a new battery in it because it's all very much uh, weather, weather sealed. Do what with them? I think mostly uh, this is the, the coyote people did this actually when they were doing research. They would put one in the abdominal cavity, but they don't have near the range as a collar, and they don't last near as long. So they, they, they were not done that. Guys in the back, I'm just going to ask you to please hold your conversation. If you guys want to chat, um, can you please go out into the lobby just so that because it's kind of hard to hear up here. Thank you so much. Oh. Anyone else have a question? Yes, sir. Um, the Lamar Canyon pack, it looks like it kind of split up into a few, and there was uh, a couple that were getting into some trouble in Cook City. Have you seen any of those wolves? I heard, you know, like after they had killed a dog in Cook City, they had wandered out of the park. I'm just wondering if you'd seen any of yeah, those this the, winter. The 926, the one that 
the car referred to as Spitfire was shot, uh, I think, in December, just outside of uh, Silvergate, legally, at that time. They had four pups, and I think we've now seen just two recently, so there's just four in the pack. Even when 926 was shot, her daughter was taking over as the alpha female, so he, he, it was a very easy transition, I would guess, not, not like the 06 situation. Yes? How do you keep track of all the different individuals, just <laughs> from their coloration or patches of fur? Well, really, I, I just find Rick. <laughs> <laughs> Unless I'm seeing an animal fairly close uh, consistently, like 21 or like 302 or 42 or 40, back in the heyday, I, I couldn't tell you one wolf from another right now. It's, it's, uh, they're so far away, and I don't do a lot of looking through scopes. If it's not close enough to film, it's, there are other species and other animals to try to film. Uh, so it is extremely difficult. And it, even for him, because you know, for years he had a receiver. He could get the signal on him. And for the last year, he's been, quote, retired, all of you would never recognize it. But one thing you do recognize is, is he does not have a, a receiver to pick up the signal. So he is not in constant association with, all right, this numbered wolf has this particular frequency, and I know what it is. And when the new wolves come in and new collars are put on, then I have to learn this particular set. But he doesn't have to do that anymore because he doesn't have a receiver. So it's not important to him. The key ones remain like the alphas and things like that. But plus, Rick is, I'll tell you a little secret, is colorblind, so he, has, he refers with, with Lori Lyman, who is excellent at, at color and, and different features and has named many of our wolves. So, so it's really kind of a, a pack of researchers and, and cooperation. Yeah. Yeah, I was noticing uh, in the film, and I think this comes up a lot, shooting. That's a word that really comes up a lot. And you see these wolves grow and I have some friends that uh, film there, and I, and I watch them, and then they end up getting shot and killed. Is there anything you can do with the behavior of the wolf to make them aware that, hey, it's hunting season, and, you know, maybe there's things that can be done that you yeah. know, can stop that from happening? Because